Good afternoon. Good afternoon. One thing, uh, Mr. Grant and Mr. and myself, we do not know when we do these sermons who is watching us. You know, outside the Church of God, that is. And so I thought it would be a good idea. Last week, we went back to Remembrance, and we're going to go back this time. We're going to go way back to find out what happened, what we do, the things we do, and bring us right up to date. For those who are watching this and you're not a person of church, you're not part of the Church of God, check this stuff out and see if I'm telling you the truth or not. If you observe any type of religious service, you may want to know why you do that. And maybe you might be wrong in what you're doing. So if you need a title for this sermon today, it's called Baal, the God of Modern Christianity. Baal, the God of Modern Christianity. It is true that very few professing Christians know why they observe the days they do. They probably don't know at all. Why is it men all over the world observe so many different ways, days of worship? What did they do that for? So many foolish customs. And they do. What you're going to see now, we're in the, we're in the, the Lent phase. I think Lent started on uh, the 14th, on Wednesday, on Valentine's Day, which is another stupid day. And during this Lent, you'll watch it. You'll see, probably from the Philippines, people doing cruel penance to themselves, crucifying themselves through customs and traditions. And the, I don't know why they would do stuff like that. They would beat themselves with cords on the back, or somebody would beat them as they go down the street. So why do they do that? No, that, where in the world do these holidays come from? Where do they come from? You may ask, being part of the churches, well, I already know. What you may not realize, that the Apostle John in the book of Revelation warned Christians about these days, and what good does it do? All through the Bible. We've been warned about these days. Were they established on the authority of God Almighty? Is that what, where these days come from? What authority can you find for all these customs and traditions of all the churches we have? And they're all over the place. Why do people observe Easter? Well, where did bunnies, rabbits come into Easter? Coloring eggs and all this stuff they do. Hot bun crosses. Why all this stuff? What about Christmas? And Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and Santa Claus and gift-giving. Do these days come from the Bible? I never did question anything like this growing up. As a child, I never asked my dad, how in the world does Santa Claus get down that chimney with a fire in there? It never entered my mind to ask him anything like that. As a child, we don't. We don't confront our parents about why are we doing this for? What does it mean? Are professing Christians observing days which are nowhere, nowhere commanded in the Bible? If you find these days, it's in a negative part. Jesus didn't keep any of these days, nor did the apostles keep them. And Christ is the founder of Christianity. He didn't keep anything like this. The very founder of Christianity never observed any of these days. So how did they come dignified with his name, with the name Christianity? How in the world did all this happen? Who conspired to have these, have them replaced the days God made holy? And how did all this happen? It's kind of fascinating, folks. It took me a little while to go through all this because I have to leave a lot of it out because it would be a three-part sermon to go through all this stuff. But it is fascinating how we come to believe what we believe and it's stuck in our minds. It's, you can't get it out. You simply cannot get it out. So it was God Almighty who created time, did he not? But it was man who abused it. God created time and man abused it. When God created the heavens and the earth, he said in Genesis 1 verse 14, Let there be light in the firmness of the heavens to divide the days from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and for years. The earth rotation regulates the length of a day, which God set in motion. The lunar phase indicates the length of a month. And the orbit around the earth, the earth, the earth around the sun indicates the length of a year. So God did all his timing, the month, the days, and the years. He 
is the author of time, as I said. But man has abused time. Since God alone created time, he alone has the authority to set aside certain days for worship and to make them holy. He alone has that privilege to do such things as that. But what we may not, do you ever wonder why human beings like to observe things, like to worship things? Because it's put in our nature to do that. It is put in our nature to, to, to desire to observe certain days. We make up our own mind. It's a basic drive in the human nature to want to worship something. And that's what we do. That's what we do. That's why every tribe and every nation, every religion, every religion singles out certain times to worship. Every, all over this earth, they're doing something to worship some type of God they have created in their own minds. I tell God all the time, we're a bunch of stupid people, aren't we? We create a God in our own mind and, and tell it what it, we want it to do. And we're our own gods, aren't we? And we are very foolish. Human beings are. But without God's own instructions, man cannot know which days God himself made holy. Did you know that? I didn't know it. I observed Sunday, Christmas, Easter, all these days, and I had no idea that what I was doing was wrong. I had no clue whatsoever. And uh, you'd think that my father would have taught me since he was a minister. But he himself did not know. And no, neither does any of the other ministers today know. I was listening to, scanning the television, and there was Pat Robinson in the 700 Club. Someone wrote and asked him a question. What does this mean? Uh, it's in Matthew 5th chapter, verse 7. I think now I have come to destroy the law, but fulfill it. They wanted to know the answer to that. This guy, this is why the world is as shape it is in. He thinks he talks to God every January. He said, Jesus Christ, fulfill the law. You don't have to do that no more. His death, fulfill the law. Folks, that's impossible. Because if you keep on reading, he tells you exactly what he means when you fulfill the law. If you lust in your mind, then you're sinning. But Pat Robinson didn't say that. He said, he did it for you. He lived, he kept the law for you in your stead. That means I can't sin. Is that right? There is no law. Where there is no transgression, there is no law. So how is that possible? Here is the man who, who millions of people listen to, who deceive people because he doesn't know what he's talking about. Not a clue. He thinks the kingdom of God is in your mind. So he worships things that he does not know why he does it. The thing is, God has not left worship to humans' whim. Whatever you want to do, let's do it. It depends on your desires, your ideas, what you want to do, human traditions. That's what I want to do. I want to do it when I want to do it, and when I want to do it, and how I want to do it. And I don't care what God says. Is basically what they're saying in their own mind. But God says this in Matthew, the 15th chapter, verse 9. Matthew, the 15th chapter, verse 9. In vain. The word vain means folly or to no purpose. In vain do they worship me to no purpose. Teachings for the doctrines and the commandments of men. Never mind, forget his commandments. Forget him, since he's the giver of time. Since he tells us what days we should worship on and how to do it, forget all that. We'll do it ourselves, is what they're saying. And that's exactly what we have done. So from this one verse, we can see that it's possible to actually worship God to venerate the name Jesus Christ and to no purpose. It's just plain old foolishness what they're doing. Plain foolishness. He goes on to say, full well you reject the commandments of God. Is that just what I told you? Is that what Pat Robson said? He rejects the commandments of God because God, Jesus Christ, kept them in your stead. What did, they do? Why did they do that? Why did they reject the commandments of God? And he goes on to say, so that you may keep your own traditions. Do what you feel like in your own mind. 
That's why they do it. They don't want anyone telling them what to do. So what's the end result of such teaching? He goes on to say in verse Matthew, I'm sorry, Mark 7, verse 7, and 9 and 13. When you do this, when you ignore the commandments of God, as modern Christianity does, because their God is Baal, he says, the word of God is none effect through your traditions, which you have delivered. They make the word of God a none effect for what they've done, what they were doing. And just as Satan deceived men into pagan Sunday worship observance, instead of keeping God's Sabbath day, Satan has been instituted these holy day, these holidays, because there was a void there. And so you have to fill the void. And so modern Christianity has used Baal to fill that void. And we go through what, who Baal is and what's going on here, because like I say, it's extremely interesting to know this. So that's what happens. You have to fill the void, and Satan has filled that void with the days which we love. Didn't you love Christmas as a child? I did, you know. I remember, I guess I was 12, 13, somewhere in that area. We went to the Christmas play at night where my dad was preaching. You know, they had the nativity scene. They had a big Christmas tree in there. I can't remember if we got presents or not, but we did get candy and oranges and things like that. But as I left the church, went home, it started to snow. And I said, there is a picture postcard Christmas right there. And you can't get that out of your mind. You enjoy things like that. You enjoy the music of Christmas. You enjoy the sounds. You enjoy the smell, especially if you've got a cedar tree in your house. You enjoy the bright lights and all that stuff. As a child, you do enjoy that. And you pass it on to your children. That's what Satan has done. He made it fun. He made these holidays fun. Easter the same way. To color Easter eggs and go hunt them, all that stuff, and dress up and all this stuff. And he makes it fun for people. They are counterfeits these days, these holidays, just as Satan himself is a counterfeit of Jesus Christ. What do you think he did this for? What do you think Satan inspired these religious people to do this for? One reason, to hide the plan of God, the supreme plan of God to bring many sons and daughters into salvation. That's why he did it. He does not want them to know this, and they don't know it. I mean, I'm around them. They don't know. They don't know why they're alive. And I didn't for the first 30 years of my life, so I was just like them. I had no clue. These holidays that people observe today, they appear to be happy. It has to be that way, or you wouldn't keep them. There appear to be happy times, right? Family comes in, times to enjoy yourself. It makes it really nice. This can't be bad. How can God reject this? We're having such a wonderful time. But in reality, this is what they are. They're only painkillers. Design, these whole holidays are designed to cover up ritualism of today's counterfeit Christianity. That's what they do. They're counterfeit. They're designed to be that way. But they're good times, aren't they? They're good times. Valentine's Day is good times. Hall Halloween is a good time for people. They love to do evil on that day. Doesn't make sense, but they love to do that. They're just painkillers designed to cover up the empty ritualism of today's modern Christianity. That's all it is. So I say they had to fill the void, and this is what Satan has done. He has filled that void that way. But why? Why in the world no one seems to question Satan's day? Why don't they question it? They just seem to be, it's a Christian. It has to be, this is Christian. Everybody just does it, so it has to be of God. It has to be Christianity. But no one questions it. I didn't, did you? I do today. It has saved me a ton of money not observing Christmas. And clothes and things for Easter. I've got that one little picture. I heard bring that one day. It's on Easter. I know it was because I'm all dressed up. I'm probably about 11 years old, surrounded by little girls in their Easter outfits also, right in front of the church. So I got to dress up. 
And that little girl's got to dress up. But I never did question my dad. And he, he probably didn't question his dad, and his dad didn't cross question him. I don't know it goes as far back as we can go. Satan's pagan holidays is nothing more than a diabolical scheme to plunge a deceived mankind. Which way, folks? Which way do you think he's, he's putting them down that narrow path or the broad way? They're going down to the broad way, and what does that, what does that lead to? Death. That's where they're going. Now, I know if you're watching this, you may probably go to church on Sunday. You, you think I'm some kind of a nut. I don't know what I'm talking about, but you can prove this. I had to prove it. You prove it to yourself and see if I'm telling you the truth or not. And see if you're going down the wrong way. See if you're going into eternal death or eternal life. Because you have a, a rendezvous, which I'm working on a sermon this morning before I come here, a rendezvous with destiny. What is it going to be? Is it going to be a destiny of eternal life or a destiny of eternal death? You go down that broad way, it's death. Satan wants people to believe you can flaunt God's, just like I just said, Pat Robinson did, flaunt God's commands. That's what they want to, he wants people to believe. Trample on his holy days. Put them underfoot and worship in whatever way you choose. You choose. Satan's ministers object to keeping God's holy days. They like to say this. Well, it really doesn't make any difference, does it? Which days you observe. All days are holy to God. Worship on whatever day that seems right to you. I've heard that. Have you ever heard that? Do what you want to do. In fact, if you pick up a Sunday morning paper, I guess it's still there. It says, pick up the choice of your Church of your choice. Pick out the Jesus Christ that fits your suit, your way of life. If that seems right to you, go for it. And it seems right to a lot of people. These lying ministers are nothing more than tools of Satan the devil. That's all they are. I don't care how well they orotate up there. I don't care how well they dress. It doesn't make any difference. If they don't keep the commandments of God, he says, you're a bunch of liars. You're not my servants. I don't even know who in the world you are. Who are you? And there are tools of Satan and the devil to see people, to lead them down the wrong way, to do away with God's holy days, to do away with God's laws, as Pat Robson said just the other day, and go that way, the way that leads to death. But God tells us we must choose whom we're going to serve. Who are you going to serve? The Lord, if the Lord be God, serve him. But if Baal, then follow him. So if you want to keep Easter, if you want to keep Christmas, if you want to keep all these pagan days, then go ahead and serve Baal. It's your choice. But you'll pay the price in the end. If Satan be God, then go ahead. If Baal is God, go ahead and keep Easter. Keep Halloween. Keep Christmas. But if the creator, the living God of all things, and we had better keep his days, and we had better make them holy. Like I said, he is the author of time. He owns everything. He knows what he's doing. He is a superior mind to all the minds that have ever existed. He has greater wisdom, greater understanding than we can ever even think about. He knows what he's doing. He knows how to bring many sons and daughters into glory. He knows how to do all that. That's exactly what he's going to do, and he has a plan to do that. And they do not include Christmas. They do not include Halloween. And all these other days we make up in our own mind. They include the Holy Days in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. Tells you exactly how he's going to go about doing this to bring many sons and daughters into glory. You, when you die, you're not going to go to heaven. What for? What are you going to do when you get there? Sit at Jesus' feet, then do what? I don't think Christ would even like that himself. It does make a difference. What days we observe. It's a matter of eternal life or a matter of eternal death. It's just that simple. But what makes this hard to understand that these people in modern Christianity who knows that these days are pagan. They know they are pagan. They really do. They can look it up in the dictionary just like I do, in the encyclopedia. They can see all that stuff. It's there. It's not hid from them. They know that these days are pagan, but still stubbornly refused to stop observing them. They do. It's 
It's in their mind. They can't get it out. And I'd say they don't want to get it out because there's so much fun there. You cannot see how this can be so bad to give presents to people. To sing the, uh, the Way in the Manger, to sing those songs, Oh, Little Town of Bethlehem. What's wrong with that? Did God do that? Did Jesus Christ do that? No. Then you come along and say, well, why did God did not warn us in the Bible about these pagan holidays? And so the world has substituted for his holidays. Folks, he did. Excuse me. He did just that. How many times did he ask to warn us? It's over and over in the Bible. It's there. But we ignore it. Just like Mr. Trent said in the sermon, we ignore the thing. He said, no one has ascended to heaven, but we still believe we're going to heaven. Every time I look at a, a obituary, he says, you've gone on to be with the Lord. Gone on to be with the Lord. And Jesus Christ warns Christians, us, folks, us, in the end times that false ministers would deceive many. Would deceive many. Matthew 24, verse 11 says, many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. These so-called ministers who preach about Jesus Christ at the same time deceive many. How is that possible? How is that possible? Well, I just told you, just quoting what Pat Robinson said just the other day. And they do it all the time. All the time. So what has happened down through the years is that these false ministers have cleverly adopted the name of Christ and cloaked it in false doctrine. Sounds good, don't it? Well, that can't be wrong. Christ's name is attached to it. Christmas. So Christ has to be a part of it. And you can read all about his false ministers and things of what they do. The angels of light in 2 Corinthians 11, chapter, verses 13 through 14. There's right there. Even in Paul's day, it was taking place. And much more today. That's what Jesus Christ said would happen in our time, in this end time church. Many would arise and deceive many. In Revelation, the second chapter, verses 2 and 6, here John was. Now, he's, these letters, folks, are not to other, uh, these are to Christian churches here. He's writing to. <coughs> He's writing the church of God at Ephesus, Ephesus and some of these uh, false ministers falsely claiming, calling themselves Christ's apostles. But how were they, how were these false apostles discovered? Now, they were in the church of God. And here John is bringing them out to them. Jude even talks about it. And he says this. Now, this is how you discover this. Now, verse 6 there in John, the second chapter. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now here's a letter to a Christian church, to God's church, church at Ephesus. But who are these Nicolaitans? Who are these people that God hated and we should hate? They were a follower of a person called Nicholas. The name Nicholas is derived from the Greek word N-I-K-O-S and L-A-O-S. I don't know how you pronounce those Greek words. Nicholas means conqueror or destroyer, and Laos means people. So here was a Nicolaitan who was a conqueror and destroyer of people that Paul or John was warning the church about to avoid these things. Nicholas was merely the Greek word for Nimrod. And I see this on ancient aliens the other day talking about all this stuff. The original arch rebel who conquered the people and founded and found made man, made man religions within two centuries after the flood. Nimrod. You hear a little, very little about that, don't you? But he was uh, Nicholas. It's just like this. It's just another Greek for the word Nimrod. And we all know who Nimrod was. When Nimrod was alive, he put himself in place of God by his dictatorial rule. When this man died, the people continued to worship him as a divine hero. His wife was an amb ambitious person. She did not want to give up all the 
power she had, her son, or her husband or wife, whatever he was to her, Semiramis, and she didn't want to give all that up. So she had to do it secretly. Connive some way to get these people, because they took Nimrod, I can't remember who, which one it was, found him, killed him, cut him up, burned him, and sent it around to other people, said, if you continue to do what he did, this is going to happen to you. And so she had to get around that. She didn't want that, so they met, started making meetings secretly called Mysteries, Mysteries of Babylon. So he continued, when this man died, he continued to be worshipped as a divine hero, Nimrod, that is. They call him Baal, of all things. Baal. Baal means master, or it means lord. But Baal wasn't Nimrod's only name. In Babylon, he was known as Tammuz. In Syria and Greece, Adonis, which means Lord. In Egypt, it was oh God Osiris. These names were used to disguise his true identity. They don't know who they just say. You watch ancient aliens, you hear these words here. I just told you about Osiris, the God of Egypt. He did this, he did that. But they don't know that this is man back in the book of Genesis who said, you are an absolute coward if you keep God's commandments. That is at least what Josephus wrote about him. But he did this to disguise his true identity. Another of his names is Santa Nimrod. This name was commonly used throughout Asia Minor. There are a lot of Santas in that period of time. So there is a connection between Nimrod, who was called Santa in Asia Minor, and St. Nicholas of Asia Minor, or Santa Claus. Santa Claus. Santa Claus is but a shortened form of St. Nicholas, or Santa Nicholas, or St. Nicholas, or Santa Claus. So the followers of St. Nicholas, or Nimrod, are termed Nicolaitans, which John warned the church about. Now, why am I telling you this? Half the church is foolish. Half the church is going to do the same thing, John, we've been warned about. My brother was, I hope he didn't do that, but I think he started keeping these days. He was been in the church longer than I had. When he, after Herbert died and they broke us apart like that, I think, they sent me a Christmas card. He sent me a Christmas card, but he forgot to send it. So his wife sent it to me after he died. So I was going to send it back to him. It'd been a lie. But I think he sent my sister a Christmas card. So he went from what he was warned not to do, to do. And I'm warning you out there. Those are the church of God. You better stay faithful to your calling. Don't be deceived by the God of this world and start keeping these foolish days which God calls an abomination, just like my brother did. I don't know what resurrection he's going to come up in. So in the New Testament, like I said, uh, uh, St. Nicholas or Nimrod is termed Nicolaitans in the New Testament. Now remember, these people call themselves Christians, folks, that were doing this. Christians. But they continued to honor Nimrod in the days of the Apostle John, just as they do today. Just as the modern descendants of the ancient house of Israel are still doing it. And so a lot of the spiritual Israelites are doing the same thing. Nimrod was opposed to God. The phrase, the phrase in the Bible, a mighty hundred before God, indicates that he set himself in opposition to and in place of the Lord. That's what man does. That's what the pharaohs call themselves gods. That's what the Roman emperors do. They call themselves gods. I'm a god. Yeah, well, let's see how long you live, God. Some of them live to be 90 years old. They all die. And they're all waiting on a resurrection. And these gods are going to rise up and they're going to meet the real God. And this is what Joseph says about Nimrod. Now it was Nimrod who excited them to such a front and contempt of God, he also gradually changed the government into tyranny. He was the boss. He was the headman, probably like this guy up in North Korea. You do what I say, when I say, you jump, and you jump as high as I tell you to jump. 
He taught that it was wrong. It was okay. You'll be a coward to submit to God and to his laws. This was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which, Jesus, which God, I mean, which John was inspired by Jesus Christ to warn the church, don't do this. I hate this stuff that you're doing. In Revelation the 17th, chapter verse 5, we see that God names and labels this false religion by the city of its origins. It's Revelation 17, verse 5, and it says, Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. The mother of harlots and abominations. Revelation 18, verse 1 through 8, this system has been perpetuated down to our very day to day. That's why God says to us, come out of her, my people, and be not partaker of her plagues. But who's paying any attention to that? That's way back then. That's 2,000 years ago. He's talking to us today. Remember the book of Revelation is a futuristic book. He goes back and, and, and with bring instant chapters there to bring us up to date. But mostly it's a futuristic book looking down to our time today just for the return of Jesus Christ that the true church is still not come out of Babylon. At least a lot of them haven't. And he's warning us. Since the time of Babel, Babel and continuing to our modern 21st century, these false religions of Nimrod has uh, dominated the world. That's true, folks. That's true. Just look around you and watch what happens. In a couple of weeks, or when is it? whenever Easter is, it comes after the Passover. And around the world, they'll start observing this stuff. I think they put a little cross on their forehead, don't they, in Lent. And they lie. I don't know if it lasts for 40 days or not. Maybe they, they don't take a bath for 40 days. I don't know. Today, his religion bears Christian names. That's why it sounds so good. But it's still pagan in its practice and its purpose. There is no purpose to holidays. No purpose about it whatsoever. That's what God says. In vain, without purpose. Just pure old foolishness. You worship me. In Genesis 11, chapter verse 8, we see that God scattered the nations of Israel, or Babel. So sometimes after the death of Nimrod, his followers continued their rebellion in secret. They developed symbolism, and they call them mysteries. These wicked priests, in order to deceive the people, began calling their customs by names which seemed to honor God himself. That's the way you do it. That's how clever Satan is, to use Christian-sounding names on paganistic ideas, and it sounds so good. He's very good at what he does of deceiving people. So Nimrod took the name Lord, which translated into Hebrew became Baal, and into Greek, Adonis. You've all heard of Adonis, haven't you? Women are crazy about Adonis. Nimrod's mother, Semiramis, or Samarius, took the name Mother of God. And to worship as Easter, or Easter, the mother, mother goddess of the dawn of light. Imagine that. And we wonder why we're in such a mess that we are. To worship such foolishness as this. A woman claimed to be the mother of God. She knew about the coming king, uh, Christ and the child. They knew about all this stuff. And so she was a diva. And she wanted to replace the mother of God. So she made herself the mother of God. She became pregnant. And she had a child named Tum Tammuz, or Horse, Horse of Tammuz, I can't remember which it was, but her husband was dead when she got pregnant. So she had to come up with some ideas to cover all this stuff up. And she did. She became the mother of God, and Nimrod became God, who impregnated her like Mary was impregnated. And that's how the world looks at it. They don't care. It's so good. To worship the way I, we worship is so good. I love it. I love going in debt. <laughs> I love doing all the things that we do. But by the 18th chapter of the book of Leviticus, you can read just how widespread 
the worship of Nimrod and Semiramis had become in the time of Moses himself. God warned Israel to avoid the ways of Egypt. Did they do that? A land filled with pagan customs and traditions and do not adopt the customs of Canaan while they were in the wilderness. Did that matter? For a while it did. For a, for a while it did. And these practices of the heathen nations had defiled the very land they live in. And this is what's going to happen to this country here because of this. That land, because they defiled the land, vomited them out so Israel could replace them. That's what happened. They defiled the land so bad with these pagan customs that it just vomited the, the heathen out. And we're going to lose our land. We're doing the very same thing. We observe the very same days. And we attach Christian names to it. We put Jesus Christ in the middle of all this nonsense. And eventually, the land is going to vomit us out. And we're going, a third of us is going into slave, slave, slave labor camps around the world. And I don't know if anybody's going to replace this, this but because of a, maybe nuclear weapons are going to be let loose on all the cities in America. But why was God so against such heathen practices in the first place? Leviticus, the 18th chapter. Why was God so angry against this? He said, uh, beginning in verse 26, Leviticus 18, chapter verse 26. He said, You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgment, and you shall not commit any of these abominations neither any of your own nation or any stranger who dwells among you, the things that he told them not to do. For all these abominations the men of the land have done who were before you, and thus the land was defiled. Lest the land vomit you out when you defile it, it'll vomit, uh, is it, when you defile it as it vomit out the nations that were before you, that were gone. He's, tell, he's warning them. He's warning Israel, don't you do this. Or you're gone too if you do it. Were they gone? Did it happen to them? Did both the house of Israel, when they split, and the house of Judah, did the land vom vomit them out and throw them out? Yeah. Israel has never returned to, uh, to Jerusalem. The Jews have, but Israel has not. Therefore, you shall keep my ordinance so that you do not commit any of these abominable customs which were committed before you, and that you do not defile yourself by them, I am the Lord your God. Did it matter? Here's a direct warning from God himself to the people of Israel back then. Did it matter? For a while they probably kept it. For a while the ancient house of Israel kept it. God punished these heathen nations who defile themselves by taking all these pagan customs and doing those things. And he cast them out of the land so Israel could inhabit those lands. And he warned them, if you do the same thing, you're gone too. And they eventually were gone. So what's the penalty for observing the customs of the paganistic heathen way? Leviticus 20, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Again, you shall say to the children of Israel, or, to, or of the strangers who dwell in the Israel, who gives any of his descendants to Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. Boy, you wouldn't do that today, would you? That's be politically incorrect. But <laughs> so we can see the penalty of sin is the same today. And God says, I change not. I don't change. And the old, under the old covenant... The civil governments of the nations executed sinners. That's how they did it. Today, God himself places the, the guilty person under the spiritual penalty of eternal death if it is not repented of. A little bit different. How many of so-called Christians assume that because they have always worshipped on pagan days and are still alive, they have somehow escaped the death penalty. Well, all of them. All of them. But in reality, is that Jesus Christ is about to return. 
which will come back with a sharp two-edged sword of God's word to condemn and to execute those who assume they can flaunt God's laws and not pay with their lives. We are going to pay, folks, harshly. God instructed his people to keep the holy days and he revealed to them. It doesn't seem to matter what God says. He says in eight, uh, 18 verse 4, you shall observe my judgments and keep my ordinances and to walk in them. I am the Lord your God. I'm not changed. I'm still the same. He shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live. By them I am the Lord. You shall live, not die. You live. You're going down the right path. We're not keeping these days. Among the statutes God was, has given Israel are the holy days. These days are reveal the way to salvation and eternal life. To keep those who keep them. That's what we want. We're not here just to be here. We're here for a purpose. We're here, first of all, because we're commanded to be here. We're here to learn. We're here to learn the Word of God. We're here to learn how to correct the mistakes in our lives, to what is right and what is wrong. We're here to, to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. We're here to grow up spiritually. We're here to develop the very heart and mind of God Himself. That's why we're here. So one day when Jesus Christ comes back, He can say, oh, there's one I want. I can see something there that I want to keep permanently forever. So he changes that person to a glorified spirit being who looks just like him, who does not worship idols, who does not commit adultery, who does not break his laws on a community daily basis, who knows and understands what sin is. He knows and keeps all these things. And he says, God says, I will bless Israel abundantly if, there's that little bitty word, if, if they keep his holy days. And he says, if you don't do that, you can read that in Leviticus 26, chapter, verses 1 through 13. I'll bless you if you do these things. But if you do not do this, God says on the other hand, you're going to suffer. And you're going to suffer terribly. That'd be from 14 through 39. Curses and blessings. Why would anyone be, want to be cursed by God? I don't know. I can't answer another person's mind. The thing about it was, and this is, this is why people do what they do. And Isaiah, Isaiah, but Jeremiah brings it right out under your inspiration. It is not in the heart of the human mind to obey God. That's it. We were not born to obey God. Our natural mind is hostile against God, as Paul writes about that in Romans. It hates God's laws. It's not subject to those laws at all. In Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter, in verse 5, verse 21, here God is pleading with us pleading the ancient house of Israel. You might as well he's pleading to us today, the modern descendants, and even the church. Oh, God says, there was such a heart in them, they would fear me, and I'll always keep my commandments, that it might be well with them and their children forever. What in the world is wrong with what he just said? To be well with you and your children. To be blessed. Just obey me. That's it. Obey me. Jeremiah says the heart is de uh, deceitful and above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And that's why people do what they do. It's the heart is carnal. It is carnal. It is in into me against God. And that can't change until Jesus Christ comes back. So less than three months ago, we and others of people around the world celebrated the customs of called Christmas. Now, this is where it gets interesting, folks. And guess what? I'm going to cut it short just a second here. In March, I guess March, and then next time I speak. So Christmas was celebrated, celebrated in Rome long before the birth of Jesus Christ. They were called Saturnalia. That's what they were called then. Toward the end of December, the Romans set aside several days to celebrate the winter solstice. That is, when the sun reached the lowest point in the heavens and the days were shortened. The highest point of the solar festival was called Saturnalia. And how did they observe that? What were the customs of Saturnalia? They're the same things identical today that 
professing Christians keep. Now, this is what the dictionary of Greek and Roman antiquities, I think it's pronounced Oscoskelia, O-S-C-I-L-L-A. In, in private, the day Saturnalia, this is what it says about it, began with the sacrifice of a young pig. All ranks devoted themselves to feasting with, and mirth and presents were, were interchanged among friends and the crowds thronged the streets shouting Saturnalia. The offerings were made beneath a decorated tree. Virgil the Point mentions is either a pine or an evergreen. Figurines and masks are called O-S-C-I-L-L-A and they were hung on the tree just like Christmas decorate today. I want to stop there because it gets a lot of interest as we go on next time I'm up here. And I think it's so interesting to know why we do the things we do and observe the things we do in which God says they're an ab abomination, especially those in the church of God. He warns us, folks, not to do this. And hopefully one day when Jesus Christ comes back, we'll finally understand.